inviting me, Martin. And it's something to give a seminar here, like uh, 20 or so years after leaving. Okay. So this seminar is going to be about HLA-DR genotypes, not alleles, like the two HLA-DR genes expressed by a given individual, and how they control its risk to develop RA, and how they somehow relate to the autoantibodies that are present in the person and, and help the development of RA. So just to remind you what RA looks like, these are the hands of a woman with RA. And the two strong points in what is known in triggering events in RA are one, this structure that you know, this is an HLDR molecule, and you know that molecules, alleles with this motif called shared epitope that are supposed to carry susceptibility to develop RA. So that's the main genetic factor. And this here is the main immunological event that's the emergence of autoantibodies to citrullinated proteins. Here, that's uh, detected by the so-called anti-CCP kit. What's important is that it's like in lupus, autoantibodies predate uh, disease. Like here, you have up to 14 years before the onset of disease. Some patients already have these anti-CCP antibodies. So these are the two key factors in RA. And this suggests this type of mechanism, like an appropriate HLA-DR background presenting something to T-help cells to get help to trigger production of pathogenic autoantibodies, among which ACPAs, or anti-citrullinated protein antibodies, are the most important. So first part of the talk will be focused on genotypes, HLADR genotypes, and how they influence development of arthritis. So this, just to situate what HLA is in the genetics of, arthrit of rheumatoid arthritis. This is a, a Manhattan plot from the North American Consortium of RA. And what it pinpoints is first, there is this major MHC signal, and then a few other signals included this phosphatase PTPN22. Now, if you look what really is contributed by all of these genes, most of the action is there in the HLA region. All the other signals will give like a maximum 1.5 odd ratio, which is almost nothing. And this, the HLA signal, is not considering the genotype effect. It's just provided you have one uh, associated sequence. That's it. So just a short reminder of the HLA-DR association with RA. It was discovered in the 70s by Peter Stastny doing, a, let's say, mixed lymphocyte culture. Then things evolved, then came the serology and serologic uh, typing allowed to distinguish like 10 different uh, alleles in the HLADR region. And association studies uh, rapidly showed that DR1 and DR4 and DR10, these in different populations, were high risk alleles regarding development of RA. And in the 80s, then came the molecular data on HLADR alleles. And it turned out that even in the HLADR4 alleles, some were associated with RA, like the R41 or 404 or 405, and some were not. And this led uh, Peter Gregersen and Robert Winchester. Uh, proposed the shared epitope hypothesis, which suggested that RA susceptibility was actually not carried by a particular allele, but more like a structural part of one of the beta chain. And this part would have this uh, QKRAA sequence, which is a rather basic uh, and a charge motif. And actually, uh, 
25 years later, this hypothesis is still considered valid. Now that dates back to 1987. More recently, in the early 20s, from 2001 to 2005, many groups have suggested that there may be also protection, that some alleles would actually protect. So we proposed that in 2001 at the same time as Bill Ollier in Manchester and a few other teams like in the years following, proposed similar stuff. In short, you still have susceptible alleles like the R1, the R4, and the R10, which are shared epitope positive. But among shared epitope negative alleles, some may be neutral and some may be protective. This was proposed because studying genotypic risk, you found that some genotypes, for instance, the R4 associated with the R7 would have lower risk than uh, other genotypes like the R4 associated with, for instance, the R3. That suggested some kind of protection. And it didn't really indicate a mechanism, but for like four or five different teams, the distribution of alleles into susceptible, neutral, or protective what about, was about the same. And everybody was, for instance, agreeing on DR7 being protective. And the, the structural basis that one supposed was responsible for that was that this pocket, the P4 pocket, could be charged, like basically charged, and it would be a susceptible allele, or neutral, and it would be a non-susceptible or resistant allele. Now, the point is, if you are playing with a system where you have three kinds of alleles, then evaluating a patient's susceptibility requires to consider both alleles that is genotype. And what you would expect is that double dose susceptible allele would be, susceptible genotypes would be very high risk. And at the opposite, uh, for instance, protective, protective genotypes would be low risk. And you would expect as well that the association of a susceptible and a protective allele would yield a neutral genotype. Now, the, the actual numbers for this have never been published, never been demonstrated. So we recently decided we would do it, but without any model in our heads, just go do the HLADR study, do the genotype, calculate genotypic risk. And the only difficulty is that it takes lots of patients. So we went for 1,000 ACPA plus RA patients, 2,000 controls, and we calculated genotype-specific risks and just checked what it looked like and whether it would match any particular model. And so that's the general data. Here you have genotypes which have been ranked by order of odds ratio from like 30 down to 0.2. And whenever it's highlighted in pink, it means it's significantly higher than one. Whenever it's in green, it means it's significantly lower than one. And the bottom line is you see that most of the genotypes on the left, the high-risk genotypes, they are actually double-dose shared epitope genotype. And that on the right, all the low-risk genotypes, they are double-dose shared epitope negative genotypes. Now, if one wants to see whether there is some protection, one can study genotypes containing one particular allele. This we did for dr 41 which is the common RA-associated DR4 subtype. And what you see is that the risk as, or the odds ratio associated with genotype drops from, this must be around 30, down to one point something, according to the second allele in the genotype. However, first, 
it doesn't reach real protection, we are still above one. And second, for some of these genotypes, the, the standard deviation is very large, so that even if we have the impression that the risk is going down with the second allele, it's not absolutely certain that there is actual protection. And you have similar data. This is for genotypes containing DR4 uh, SE for shared epitope, which means DR4, 4, 4, 4, 5, 4, 8. You also have some kind of uh, tampering of the, the, the genotype effect by the second allele. And with DR uh, beta 101, you also have the similar effect, except that the risk starts lower and you have the impression that a few alleles, like DR13 or DR8, can really take the risk down below one. Now, this really, what, what we have found really shows nicely in this table, which is a practical table. You have on the two dimensions, you have a list of the different alleles, and suppose you have a patient or even a normal subject, you want to know what his risk is to develop RA. You just cross, for instance, patients with the R, or subject with the R10 and the R41, uh, let's say the R10, the R41, you go for the intersection and you read the risk, which is 28. Bottom line is, in this upper left corner, what you have are double dose genotypes. In this down uh, right corner, you have double dose shared epitope negative genotypes. And you see that the highest risks, they are here, it's double dose shared epitope. The lowest risks are there, it's double dose negative shared epitope. And in between, you have the one dose shared epitope risk. So what this suggests is that the main, the main thing still is the shared epitope. There is no obvious protection, and there is an obvious dose effect. Two doses, one dose, and zero dose. So that's actually a, a practical table we can use now in the clinic. So to summarize this genetic effect of HLA-DR beta-1, first, DR beta-1 genotypes influence the risk to develop ACPA-positive RA. Two, double-dose shared epitope-positive genotypes contribute highest risk. Three, double-dose shared epitope-negative genotypes contribute lowest risk. Four, there is no total protection allele question, how does that work? Is peptide binding involved? And is it only peptide binding? So the second part is now playing with these GR genotypes and how they influence autoantibodies and, and by which means. So that's the same idea. HLA molecule, peptide, T helper cell autoantibody, how does that work? So we focus first on ACPA because they precede the development of RA and they recognize citrine residues on many different proteins. Actually, nobody knows really if there is one particular citrinated protein that's the target of them. They are usually detected by so called anti CCP kits. But these are not actual proteins, you know, CCP are just synthetic peptides. Nobody really knows what is in these kits. So we decided we would work with proteins rather than CCP. So that's a reminder just that the anti-CCP is up before the onset of RA. So citrulline, as you know, is a modified arginine, which is neutralized. <coughs> And we started playing with anti-citrullinated fibrinogen antibodies just because we wanted to play with a protein, not a kit. And fibrinogen was the most interesting candidate because it's highly expressed in the joints. 
So first question we asked was, are RA-associated HLDR alleles also associated with production of antibodies to citrullinated fibrinogen? And the answer is yes. So this is an association study, roughly 400 RA patients from Marseille and also a couple of patients from Sweden. Here you have the effect of genotypes containing two shared epitope. And there, the effect of genotypes with just one shared epitope. So for instance, here, AB stands for DR44, DR41. And what you see is that in these patients, you have 96% of positive, 96% of them are positive to citrullinated fibrinogen. So the double dose genotypes here, they are at the minimum at 75% positive. The single dose genotype there, they are slightly lower. And the one winner is always this DRbeta1044 allele. Now, another important thing to see is that here, you still have like 55% of the patients with no shared epitope who still have anti-citrullinated uh, fibrinogen. It means that there is no need for the shared epitope to develop anti-citrullinated fibrinogen. So the answer is there is an association and the champion is uh, the Orbita 1044. Now, this association being found, uh, how does that work? And especially, does citrullination matter in, uh, in this association and in the binding to DR alleles? So the idea that's tested here is that this P4 packet would control the binding of citrullinated peptide, the idea being if this is basic and if the citrullinated peptide is less basic than the original peptide, then you would get here a good binding that we wouldn't get on an uncitrullinated peptide. So we started synthesizing peptides from the A and B chain of fibrinogen. That was like 100 peptides from the A and 60 something from the B chain. And we tested binding to five DR alleles, like 414-411, these are shared epitope positive, and 42701 negative and supposedly uh, protective. So what I show you here is binding data to different alleles of peptides from A, the alpha chain of fibrinogen, or B, the beta chain. Let's go just for the alpha chain. It goes the same with the other one. So DR404, which is our champion associated allele, is also the champion peptide binder. You have like, I can't read, but it's around, I guess, uh, 18 or something like that, peptide bound. Now, if you want to check among these peptides, uh, uh, I forgot to tell you, whenever there was an arginine residue in a peptide. We synthesized both the arginine and the citrullinated version. And this is all peptide combined, like 18 uh, peptide bound. And here are the native arginine peptide, and here are the citrulline. Bottom line is, generally speaking, a given allele with bi will bind as many citrullinated as native peptides. These data do not suggest that citrullination would improve binding. What it suggests rather is that there is binding of peptides from uh, fibrinogen to most HLADR alleles. The most associated binds the most peptide, and I don't see any influence of citrullination on the binding. Second part of that study, T cell responses. So what we took was patients, controls, run proliferative, uh, uh, proliferative assays using peptides whenever we were sure that the peptide from fibrinogen could bind one of the DR alleles present in the patient. Uh, 
And whenever we did this proliferative data, we, we did it both with the native and citrullinated peptide. What we found was that both, uh, we found T cell responses mostly in RA patients, almost never in controls, and no difference between citrullinated and non-citrullinated peptide. So to summarize this relationship between DR and peptide binding on fibrinogen, every DR allele binds fibrinogen peptides. DR404 is the best. Citrullination is not critical. And T cell proliferative response to citrullinated or not citrullinated fibrinogen is common in RA and not common in healthy controls. Now, this is very much against a dogma that these days pushed by the Swedes and the Dutch, and which says shared epitope binds citrullinated peptides and helps treating RA uh, this way. This dogma is based on one paper from Jonathan Hill published in 2003. And it was a very small paper, no control, no whatever, showing that one peptide from Vimentin could bind the R4-1 under citrullinated form, not under arginine form. So this is, I think, very shaky data. And I think that at this time, it's very important that it will be reconsidered. And still, the big questions are, there is production of autoantibodies to citrullinated fibrinogens. Where are the T cells? And to start with, which protein do they recognize to, to trigger that? So situation, peptide, citrullinated peptide binds shared epitope to help production of ACPA is a shaky model at this time. I don't have any better model, but I think this is wrong. So, second part of the second part. We have seen that ACPAs are critical in defining RA these days. Now, if you look at most series, there are about a third of the patients who don't have ACPR, and they are still considered RA patients. So what is it? Is it misdiagnosis? And what can be made to, to rescue them? So the question is, does ACP and negative R exist? There are people who don't uh, agree with that. And can we define markers to identify it? First, when we looked at our files to, to do the the risk analysis on DR genotypes in RA patients in the absence of ACPA, we were very disappointed to see that you have to get rid of many, many files because you discover lots of misdiagnosed patients. I would say that a reasonable rheumatology world would have like 50% of misdiagnosis among its so-called ACPA patient, negative patients most of them with psoriatic arthritis, I'd say. But still, there are two very large-scale studies of ACPA-negative RA patients, one in England and one from Japan, who both have shown that about 50% uh, of their patients express the shared epitope and are RF positive. This is interesting because it suggests that they might be another antibody system also, uh, let's say, uh, triggered by the presence of DR-beta-1 shared epitope positive allele. And it's very interesting to try to identify these two antibody systems. So we tried different systems. And finally, we, we went fishing using the in vitro gen uh, chips, which actually we like a lot. This is work done, most of the work now is done using the version 4, which contains like uh, 8,000 and something 
proteins, human proteins, on a chip. So you just uh, hybridize it with the serum sample, and then you analyze it and see what you found. So we went fishing for new autoantibodies with sera from RA patients, some of them ACPA+, plus, some ACPA-, minus, angspon, SLE, uh, systemic sc uh, sclerosis, and controls. In the end, what we found was, on average, out the, of the 8,000 uh, proteins, an average person would recognize rough, around 100 proteins, which was kind of surprising. Then we identified two very interesting proteins on these chips. We started, you know, with unidentified uh, protein spots, and when we got the results, there were two spots that were really outstanding. And when we got their identities, it was really striking because the first one was PAD4, and the second was BRAF. So PAD4 is the enzyme that makes the citrullination, and BRAF is, as you know, a kinase on the starting the MAP kinase uh, pathway. So I'm going to talk now a little bit of these two on these two new targets. So PAD4, the enzyme that makes that transform arginine into citrulline. It's built a little bit like that. It has a N-terminal domain, a C-terminal domain, which is the catalytic domain. And we rapidly uh, found that PAD4 as a, a diagnosis antigen was not interesting because just look at the, this part of the, of the graph. This is the percentage of positive sera in yellow in early RA, in red in RA after five years, in green in controls. So the PAD protein itself was not interesting because you do nothing with a, a serodiagnosis that would light up like 10% of controls. So we gave up on the whole protein and started playing with peptides. So that's just peptide epitope mapping. So we use peptide from the whole protein. And we ended up with like three interesting peptidic uh, antigenic sites called P2261-63. And this is what you find when you use them in RA and controls. You see that P22 and P63 are seen by a few patients but also many controls between 10 and 20 percent, so that's not interesting for diagnosis. And on the other hand, this P61 has no signal and controls, but fishes less than 10 percent of our patients, so it doesn't seem too good. Only interest for this P63, uh, i show you back. So this P63 that fishes like one third of our patients is interesting because it's also positive in like one third of ACPA negative RA patients. That's the the lines on the left. Is ACPA positive RA, ACPA negative RA. So you can light up about a third of ACPA negative RA with this PAD63 antibody but it's still not a very interesting tool. Second protein, BRAF, which is this kinase on the MAP kinase pathway. So it, you know, BRAF is interesting in cancer. It's mutated in melanoma, in hairy cell leukemia. It's a fantastic target for treatment. And somehow it's also a target of autoantibodies in RA. I'm not showing you functional data, but our autoantibodies that you, we detect to be rough in about, uh, let's say, a third of our, of our patients, they activate BRAF. So, as a diagnosis tool, anti BRAF autoantibodies are not very interesting. Here on Western blot, we had the impression it, it was interesting, but then 
we started playing with uh, ELISA assay with purified protein. And once again, we had a lot of signal on healthy subject, like 10% is not interesting. You do nothing with that. So that's not an interesting diagnosis tool. But then if you go epitope mapping, it's different. We designed, we found that two peptides from BRAF were actually good targets in RA patients. The first one, BRAF10, is not too interesting because in controls, it also lights up more than 10%. But the second one we call P25 is interesting because it's really specific, almost not seen in controls and seen by about 20% of our patients. And which is more interesting is that this BRAF peptide, this BRAF P25, is seen by even more RA patients when they are anti-CCP negative, ACP and negative RA patients, about a third of them. So a summary of anti-PAD P63 and anti-BRAF P10 and P25. Anti-PAD 63 is uninteresting because it lights up too many controls. Anti-BRAF 10 is not very interesting for similar reasons, but anti-BRAF P25 is interesting because it's specific because it lights up about a third of ACPA negative RA patients. Now, I have to remind you that when we are talking about ACPA negative RA patient, this is not uh, what I would call a screened ACPA negative RA patients population. If you really go strictly into the files, you're going to uh, get rid of some of these patients, and probably this percentage would rise. So summary on PAD4 and BRAF in RA. PAD4 is not interesting as a diagnosis antigen, but we can ask a better question. Can it be an initial target in the development of RA? And I show you here why. PAD4 is a protein that binds any kind of antigen being citrinated. PAD4 is the target. Of, auto, of IgG antibodies. If you think of the T helper cells, which are helping production of antibodies to citrullinated proteins, they are not really identified. Now, if PAD4 was seen by these proteins, by these uh, T helper cells, then you could uh, imagine a helper carrier mechanism that would explain that any kind of citrullinated protein bound by PAD4 could then become the target of autoantibodies uh, to citrulline, to any kind of citrullinated protein. So maybe there is no unique T cell target at the start of anti citrulline antibody formation. Maybe the important target is PAD4 itself. Any kind of protein that it would bind would be then citrullinated and would be capable to receive help uh, from that would be provided by T helper cells who had been targeted to PAD4. So that's a putative mechanism. It's still to be demonstrated. Excuse me, have you tested the T cell response to this PAD4 enzyme? Yeah, the problem is. What we lack is very early RA patients, but some of them do have T cell responses to PAD4. Uh, what would be required really would be to have access to pay, not very easy, but you know, to patients who are most likely to develop RA. But this would be, you know, you would need that even before the uh, development of ACPAs. So maybe, for instance, patients with particular genotypes like DR4144, for whom you know the risk is very high, they're going to get RA. And 
take blood samples, freeze the T cells, and get ready to to do that if they develop RA. But that's it's really difficult to organize. So what about the SLD or other autoimmune disease? Do they have this antibody against the pad before and perhaps the... Uh, pad for... The, the BRAF P25 has a few background signal in lupus, but it's not very common. I'd say maybe 5 to 10 percent of lupus patients have anti P25. So, second part, part uh, so we just said PAD4 might be an interesting target. Uh, not target, an interesting uh, triggering uh, antigen in anti-CCP immunization. And the other protein, P25, may be interesting to diagnose ACPN negative RA and maybe even a target for treatment. In any case, it's very interesting that a protein that's important in, T cell, in cell activation that's known to be mutated in cancer might also be a, a target of activating antibodies in RA. And just a, a minute to, to finish. At this point, what we would like to do is to subdivide RA in subgroups just using what we have. So we have now like 1,000 RA patients in these little boxes. Whenever you have a risk, it means you have patients with these genotypes. So maybe like here, we have maybe 50 patients with these genotypes, and here, I don't know, 10. And here you have also a few patients. And we have a tool to analyze the two antibodies. And what we are doing now is trying to identify for each of these little squares these little genotypes groups identify a particular autoantibody pattern. The idea being that whatever the, the meaning of the association is, there is an association between genotypes and autoantibodies, and somehow it should be possible to, to subgroups, to, to, to subgroup patients using that information. So, to summarize this whole story, first, RA is an HLA-DR genotype-driven disease. It's mediated by autoantibodies, some of them the majority to citrullinated proteins, and there are also other autoantibodies, for instance, to BRAF. The link or the mechanism why DR genotypes and ACPR are associated is not clear but it's not uh, citrulline peptide binding to shared epitope. This is not serious. ACPA negative RA exists, and one can hope to rescue about half of it using this BRAF P25, which is not that bad. Half of it means about, uh, if you say ACPA negative RA is like one third, half of it is like 16, 17% or so. And hopefully, we'll be able to split RA into subgroups by the orbital one genotyping and serology into these homogeneous groups of patients. So, this is work done in Marseille. So, you see, Marseille very much like San Diego is a north south coast. We are down south, in green, that's the hospital, a rheumatology ward that just deals with arthritis. In red, the lab, on the Lumini campus, which, as you see, is not so bad, even compared with local campuses. That's my team, and on my left here, Isabelle Auger, who is really my right hand. And just to another view from, not exactly from the lab, but five minutes from the lab, just to show you, it's really a nice area. And that's my 
team, my clinical team, and for information, our clinical rheumatology ward was ranked number one in France like three years in a row by different, you know, papers they rank staff. And, and that's it. Thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, John. I think it was a uh, really enlightening overview of history and concepts. So, I think we can let you all know what you want to do. So, you, you say that um, the anti-circulated uh, peptide antibodies are important in pathogenesis. So, uh, are, are they more than markers, and how does that work? Well, there are lots of demonstrations like you can activate macrophages with uh, ACPA, and even you can amplify that with rheumatoid factors. So that's uh, some kind of yeah, activation mechanism. Uh, there are a few models, a few mouse models of um, arthritis using uh, immunization with, well, uh, let's say strategies to get uh, anti-citrulline in mice. But none of these models is very satisfactory. Salvo. Uh, Jean, thank you for this overview. It is certainly uh, very emotionally important. For me, it was my uh, advisor when I had the postdoc. Two questions. One is clinical, and the other one is mechanistic. The clinical question is, uh, uh, did you, uh, when you stratify based on uh, combination of genotypes and antibodies, do you see any clinical differences? The mechanistic question is, I don't understand very well, what do you mean with T cell recognition, help of path for Because to see peptides means there is a degradation of the protein, which is then present. Unless you have other ties. Uh, okay, I start with the second question. Yes. It's all immunology. It's the so-called apten ap and carrier stuff. If you have a protein, it may contain T epitopes and B epitopes. And you may very well have recognition by T cells of some epitopes and then help to other epitopes seen by B cells. Now, this effect doesn't require the T epitopes and the B epitopes to be on the same protein. It can be on neighbor proteins. And PAD is very interesting because as it is a binder, it can itself, being the T epitope, so the carrier, bind a B epitope, which is the AP10, and then you think that it would allow to give help to any kind of protein bound by PAT4. That would be nice because it would explain this weird situation that we get anti-citrullinated antibodies to lots of different proteins, but we don't have any clear T cell target. So all remains to do, all what remains to do is actually to demonstrate it, but this is not easy because you have to do it before the emergence of ACPA. It requires longitudinal T cell studies prior to the emergence of RA. And the other question was, is there anything clean cut in the genotypic analysis of the, of the chips more or less? I would like to say yes, but I don't have enough money. At this time, we have not done the 1,000 uh, patients. We have like maybe 100. This technology is very nice, but it costs like $1,000 or euro per patient. So it's trouble because doing it in a nice way to allow then statistical analysis, it would require to get uh, about a million bucks, which I don't know what it is in California, but definitely in France, it's a lot of money. So we do it slowly and we are farting because the damn uh, chips keep changing. So one year you do 50 patients on version four, next year you order the staff, it's version five, and you cannot compare and you cannot add up. So it requires special money on a brutal basis to do it. Yes? What about just correlating with severity of disease? 
Well, genotypes and severity, that's stuff that's been done before. Uh, let's say, severity is a pattern I don't like, because it's dependent on disease and it's dependent on treatment and on patient. I mean, it depends whether the patient is diagnosed, whether it's nicely followed or not. It's a pattern I feel has no strengths. It, this is clinical research, and when I say clinical research, I'm being very negative. I mean, it is stuff I think you sell to companies, I mean, to, you know, to biotech, to, to biotherapy companies. I don't think it really exists. I agree. I just, I just wonder if having the admission genotype leads to triggering of the disease versus actually being part of the pathology and severity. I don't know. I don't even understand whether triggering or being part of pathology is really different. Yeah, Some, somehow you help production of pathogenic autoantibodies. This, I'm sure, is important. But at least most of the literature considers that double dose genotypes are associated with severity, especially the ones with DR4. For instance, DR4144 is, is, and 4141, both are suspected to be very severe. So you sure that the situation of the peptide is not affecting the bind to the shared expression? I wonder if that situation of the pocket itself, the shared expression, if it's a basic, can affect the binding to the name. That's a good question, and I've never thought about it. Obviously, this pocket could be citrullinated, and there is no reason a HLDR molecule would not. So you score, I don't know, but that's a good idea. Well, all we did was some uh, in vitro uh, assay. I don't know whether it has any relevance. Because, you know, BRAF is intracellular. I mean, the antibodies are not supposed to be there. I'm, I'm not so excited about this uh, data on activation, else I would have showed it. But the, the point is, I think it's more interesting to wonder what's happening in RA that triggers a production of autoantibodies to BRAF. I'm pretty sure there is some mutation and probably different from the classical melanoma V600 E or something like that. So, so is there anything that showed up in the GMO studies with uh, BRAF steps? Uh, I, I missed the question. The, the, the GWAS studies in right? Yeah? No. But this is not germline. You know, what has been published and what we also find is that there is a small percentage of BRAF that's uh, mutated. It's actually tricky technically to, to catch them because you need to amplify a very small population, but we have now a PhD student doing it, and she's consistently, not consistently, but she finds like 40% of our patients have, say, one person.